Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by... When the world gets complicated, a lot goes through your mind. With Fidelity Wealth Management, a dedicated advisor can tailor advice and recommendations to your life. That's Fidelity Wealth Management. Consumer Cellular. Johnson and Johnson. Financial services firm Raymond James. BNSF Railway. The Candida Fund, committed to advancing restorative justice and meaningful work through investments in transformative leaders and ideas. More at CandidaFund.org. Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security at Carnegie.org. And with the ongoing support of these individuals and institutions. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The U.S. presidential race is focused tonight on a potentially critical question. Will President Trump accept the election results if he loses? He won't say explicitly, and that, in turn, has sparked criticism across the board. Amna Nawaz has the day's developments. What country are we in? Democrats, including former Vice President Joe Biden, in disbelief. Look, uh, he says the most irrational things. I, I don't know what to say. After President Trump's latest remarks about the election, responding to this question in the briefing room yesterday. Do you commit to making sure that there's a no, peaceful wanna, transfer of power? We want to have get rid of the ballots and you'll have a very trans we'll have a very peaceful there won't be a transfer, frankly. There'll be a continuation. Uh, the ballots are out of control. You know it. Following Mr. Trump's failure to commit to the constitutional standard for every American election since the country's founding, the Senate passed a resolution committing to a peaceful transfer of power. And lawmakers, including House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, weighed in. That a president of the United States would place in doubt the idea of the peaceful transfer of power is, uh, well, it's no surprise. A number of Republicans also spoke out to quiet concerns. Every single Republican up here, I believe, is absolutely behind a peaceful transfer when, in, when a sitting president loses. Let me put it all to rest for all of you. It'll be a smooth transition, no concern on the outcome. Other members of the president's party took to Twitter to respond. Yes. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell insisted there will be an orderly transition just as there has been since 1792. Florida Senator Marco Rubio pledged to peacefully swear in the president in 2021. And Utah Senator Mitt Romney dismissed anything other than a peaceful transition as unthinkable and unacceptable. Former Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, however, backed the president, tweeting, smart candidates never concede anything before an election. They focus on what it takes to win. <laughs> it's not the first time President Trump has called Secretary into question Clinton, whether he'd Trump, accept Trump, election Trump, results. Right During a 2016 Trump, presidential Trump, debate, Trump, candidate Trump was asked this by Fox News' Chris Wallace. Do you make the same commitment that you will absolutely, sir, that you will absolutely accept the result of this election. I will look at it at the time. I'm not looking at anything now. I'll look at it at the time. Wallace asked him again this summer. Can you give a direct answer? You will accept the election? I have to see. Look, you, I have to see. No, I'm not going to just say yes. I'm not going to say no. And I didn't last time either. As he left the White House this afternoon, the president doubled down on that message, returning to his unfounded doubt of mail-in ballots. We want to make sure the election is honest, and I'm not sure that it can be. I don't... I don't know that it can be with this whole situation, unsolicited ballots. Vote Vote Earlier at the Supreme Court, the president drew strong public reaction while paying his respects to the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The president has said he intends to announce his pick to replace Ginsburg this weekend. 
For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Amna Navaz. I'm Stephanie Sai with NewsHour West. We'll return to Judy Woodruff and the full program after these headlines. Officials in Louisville, Kentucky, are bracing for a second night of protests over the Breonna Taylor killing and have extended a nightly curfew through the weekend. Two officers were shot and wounded last night after the, the decision not to charge police with Taylor's death. Correspondent Yamichelle Cinder has our report. Last night in Louisville, Kentucky, protesters' demands for justice for Breonna Taylor gained new urgency. They came soon after a grand jury brought no charges against two officers who fatally shot Taylor in her home. The officers were attempting to serve a drug warrant in March. A third officer, who has already been fired, was indicted for recklessly shooting into a nearby apartment. Taylor, who was sleeping before officers shot her, had no criminal record and no drugs were found in her apartment. Kentucky's attorney general said the officers who fired repeatedly acted in self-defense after Taylor's boyfriend fired a single shot. Angry and distraught, hundreds took to the streets for protests across the nation, from Los Angeles to New York City. It's definitely going to be in the history books. If we do nothing, the police are going to continue to commit genocide on my brothers and sisters. In Washington, D.C., this young, amazing woman who is contributing to her community gets shot down because they went to the wrong house looking for some ex-boyfriend. The whole thing is so infuriating. Demonstrations were largely peaceful. But in Louisville, two police officers were shot. Both are expected to recover. One suspect has been charged. It's unclear if he was a protester. In Washington, President Trump commented on the violence as he left the White House. I also uh, think it's so sad what's happening with everything about that case, including law enforcement. So many people suffering, so many people needlessly suffering. But with respect to Brianna, we give our regards to the family. Today in Louisville, more protests geared up. Our community is hurting. Mayor Greg Fisher, who announced police reforms in a $12 million settlement with Taylor's family last week, said he understood the disappointment. The question, obviously, is what do we do with this pain? We never had control over what Attorney General or the grand jury would do. We do have control over what happens next in our city. A curfew in Louisville remains in effect for the next two nights. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Yamichelle Sendor. Another 870,000 Americans filed for unemployment benefits last week. That was a slight increase from the previous week, but down from the peak of the pandemic. Overall, unemployment remains at historically high levels. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin talked up the recovery today. At the same time, Democrats pressed the Trump administration to negotiate a new relief package. They spoke at a Senate hearing. America is in the midst of the fastest economic recovery from any crisis in U.S. history. The August jobs report showed that the economy had gained back 10.6 million jobs, nearly 50 percent of the jobs lost due to the pandemic. And I hope that you and the president don't dislocate your shoulders by patting yourself in the back saying good job. I mean, I, I know you think the economy is doing well, but if you're talking to your wealthy friends on Wall Street, but things are pretty bad for most working Americans are going to get worse unless you come up with a real package. House Democrats now plan to offer a pared down relief bill in a bid to jumpstart negotiations. Firefighters battling a destructive blaze in the hillsides of Los Angeles have gained the upper hand. The Bobcat fire is now 50 percent contained. Evacuated residents are being allowed to return. Twenty large fires are currently burning in California. The Pac-12 will kick off this fall, reversing an earlier decision to postpone play until spring due to COVID-19. The conference set a November 6th start date for a seven-game regular season. The decision follows the Big Ten's announcement last week that they'll start play next month. And in Australia, wildlife crews have rescued 88 pilot whales so far after the largest mass stranding ever recorded there. Crews in western Tasmania are working to move surviving animals back out to sea. At least 380 whales have died. 
Still to come on the news hour with Judy Woodruff, we look at the ways Americans vote by mail and the extensive verification systems already in place. The Trump administration's response to the pandemic raises questions about the future of American health care. COVID-19 complicates the lives of many older Americans who hit the road in search of seasonal work, plus much more. This is the PBS NewsHour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. The president's outright refusal to commit to a peaceful transfer of power ties directly to his criticism and false statements about mail-in voting. Mail-in ballots are expected to hit a record level in this election. The president insists they can't be trusted, but many state officials say otherwise. We're going to discuss President Trump's unprecedented statement shortly. But first, Miles O'Brien has a report on how mail-in voting really works and what past experience shows. It's August 14th in Ocala, Florida four days until a primary election, and most of the ballots have been cast. They roll in every day in bins from the post office, right past the office of Wesley Wilcox. What's today? Three. Three. Good deal. Supervisor of elections for Marion County. If you'd asked me 10 years ago, if you'd asked me five years ago, or if you'd asked me five minutes ago, am I a proponent of vote by mail? I am. I like vote by mail. And so do most Floridians. The state that became infamous for antiquated, ambiguous punch card voting during the disputed Bush versus Gore presidential contest 20 years ago has fully embraced early voting and absentee ballots for anyone who asks, including Palm Beach resident Donald Trump. Thank you very much. Who votes by mail while repeatedly trashing the process, suggesting it is rigged and rife with fraud. All these ballots come in, these mailed ballots come in. The mail ballots are corrupt, in my opinion, and they collect them and they get people to go in and sign them, and then they they're forgeries in many cases. It's a horrible thing. The rhetoric is not supported by reality. The Conservative Heritage Foundation maintains an online database of documented election fraud cases in the United States. It lists 204 cases of absentee ballot fraud with 143 criminal convictions over the past 20 years. On average, that's one case per state every seven years, representing about 0.00006% of total votes cast. A lot of the things that, that people talk about, vote by mail, just aren't reality. You know, you can't run down to the Wawa or the Circle K and pick up a handful of vote-by-mail ballots. It's just not there. Amber McReynolds is CEO of the National Vote at Home Institute and Coalition. And the reason it's exceedingly rare is that there's multiple steps and checks in the system that prevent it and, and would identify it if, if it were to occur. McReynolds was director of elections in Denver when the state of Colorado left traditional election day polling behind in 2013. In Colorado, every active registered voter gets a ballot in the mail automatically. They can return the ballots by mail, at drop boxes, and a few choose to vote in person. Jocelyn Bucaro is Amber McReynolds' successor. We only had about 1% of our voters in, in the state primary vote in person. Um, so that, you know, tells us that, and we hope will we'll be repeated in November, that voters will vote that ballot at home and use one of our secure methods to return it. Bucaro and her team showed me how they do it. Ballot envelopes here are imprinted with an intelligent mail barcode, a number unique to each voter which allows tracking through the mail. The envelopes are run through a customized mail sorter that is connected to the registration database. Drake Ramke is a project coordinator here. So anytime I run this machine, it's got the most up-to-date information. So if somebody voted in person an hour ago, and then we get their mail ballot that comes through, it's gonna be kicked out as void because they voted in person out. So it's real time. Signatures are initially checked with software. About 20% are automatically accepted that way. The rest are verified, along with 2% of the machine choices, to double-check its performance. 
we do extensive training both internally and then we bring in a handwriting expert that has worked with the FBI for prior to every election to give more tips. The envelopes are opened by machines to maintain the secrecy of ballots. Then they are fed into high-speed scanners to be tallied. Voters are instructed to carefully fill in the ovals. But on some ballots, 1.6 percent in the last election, they don't fill them in completely or use X's, checks, or other markings. And in that case, the software will ask humans to take a look at that and say, is this a mark or not? And we have bipartisan teams of election judges who do that ballot adjudication. Colorado is among six states that vote almost entirely by mail. But the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted others to consider ways for people to vote without spending a lot of time in line with strangers. And I started getting a lot of calls, like, what would this look like? Could we scale this nationally? She says yes, but not without difficulty. The June 9th primary in Georgia was a case in point. More than a million people voted by mail. The previous record was 35,000. This created chaos and confusion. Many voters didn't get their ballots in time and were uncertain that their votes were received and counted. That prompted Wanda Hayes to try a belt and suspenders approach. I met her waiting in a long line to vote in person. Did you try to vote absentee? I sure did. What happened? Well, I, I, I received my ballot and I sent it in, but I don't know if it was received or not. So, oh, so you want to make sure? Yes, right. Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger says 1,000 Georgians double voted in the June primary and August runoff. The announcement gave some traction to President Trump's critique of mail-in voting and his suggestion to supporters to try and vote twice. But Raffensperger warned the public that what the president is encouraging people to do is a crime. Double voting is a felony. It's a minimum of one year in prison, up to 10 years, up to a $100,000 fine, and we will prosecute. Back in Florida, Wesley Wilcox's team is taking this unprecedented election year in stride. They didn't break a sweat sorting, processing, and scanning ballots in the August primary. By election day, they only needed to push a button to tally the votes. But elsewhere, things are not running as smoothly. In Tennessee, the law prevents election workers from even opening envelopes containing ballots until election day. Several other states, including Michigan and Pennsylvania, have similar constraints. Wilcox is hearing a lot from his counterparts in places where they are struggling to answer the mail. This is an extraordinary election. Are they all kind of freaking out? You know, short answer, probably yes. But there's the election administrator prayer, you know, Lord, I don't care who wins as long as they win big. You know, and that's the reality. The reality is, election night will likely be more like election week, while we all wait for the envelopes, please. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Miles O'Brien in Ocala, Florida. And now to discuss the security of our election and the president's failure to commit to a peaceful transfer of power, I'm joined by Kathleen Hall Jamison. She is director of the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg Public Policy Center. Kathleen Hall Jamison, welcome back to the news hour. Before we get to that, I do want to follow up on Miles O'Brien's reporting just now. And by the way, President Trump again denigrating mail in balloting uh, voting. Uh, he called it a, a whole big scam uh, today. Tell us in brief, what is your sense of the reliability of mail-in voting historically in this country? The academic evidence is clear. The amount of, of problematic voting is so extraordinarily small that barring an extraordinarily unusual circumstance, an election will not be so close that any of that could make any difference. So let's move on to talk about uh, what President Trump has been saying the last few days, uh, casting doubt, raising questions about whether he would accept the results of the election if he loses. Um, how would you sum up, and he's been making these statements just in the last day or so, but how would you sum up what he said over the time of his entire presidency? The assumption that if the president were to lose, it would mean that the election is rigged was an extremely problematic statement. 
uh, as was the statement in 2016 that suggested that he would wait to see whether or not he should concede. But there is also another element that's problematic in this chain of statements across time. And that's the statement that says, um, in case it's more political than it should be, and this is the outcome, it's important to have a ninth justice. That assumes that we can't trust the independence of the judiciary, that the justices don't follow the Constitution and the law, that the four justices nominated by Republican presidents would side automatically, regardless of the law and the Constitution, with the Republican. And those nominated by a Democrat would automatically side with Joe Biden, and that the ninth justice nominated by the president presumably would automatically side with the president. That calls into question another of the fundamental assumptions we make about our system of government. It's checks and balances that have protected us across time. It's the ingenuity of the founders that gave us three branches. And those other two branches are there to protect us from executive overreach. Have we ever before, Kathleen Hall Jameson, heard a president connect the number of justices on the court uh, in connection with uh, whether or not his own reelection may be accepted, uh, may have to end up in court? Have we ever seen this kind of connection drawn by a president? No, we have not. And because it was the Supreme Court that guided us through the 2000 outcome, which is, as you know, is an extraordinarily close outcome, we have in our history the ability to say to nations across the world, when it was extraordinarily close, our three branches of government worked. Our constitutional checks and balances structure and our willingness to grant the independence of the judiciary made it possible for the country to accept the outcome. But never did anyone call into play the assumption, bring, bring up the possibility that there would not be a peaceful transfer of power. Al Gore, who had actually called to congratulate uh, then, he assumed, President-elect, which withdrew that concession, waited through the process, and as soon as the outcome was decided, clearly by the Supreme Court, he acknowledged that in a concession speech, and we had the peaceful transition. And we could say to the world, under that problematic, difficult circumstance, an extremely close election, decided over a difficult period of time, our system worked. The nations across the world are looking to us now, and I assume wondering if all these years when we've said free and fair elections, persons' votes actually counted peaceful transfer of power, if Vladimir Putin isn't just laughing, saying this is a propaganda coup for Russia and all the statements it's made across time, saying the U.S. actually isn't founded on any of that. And I know that's something you've done a lot of reporting on. But, but just finally, why does it matter? I mean, what is the harm done if the president himself is the one who is saying, well, I'm not sure I'm going to accept the results. We have to see what happens. Why does that matter? We need to have confidence that the process of campaigning and the process then of voting as a result of observing the campaign and calling on your experiences, your partisan dispositions, and casting a vote is going to yield an outcome that is determined by we, the people, and by our electoral system, including the electoral college structure. And to the extent that someone suggests there's something else at play, that is, the ability of a president potentially to decide whether the election is free and fair, whether it's been rigged or not, calls into question the suppositions of our system of government. That is deeply problematic. And we should point out that a number of Republicans, uh, even those who typically are right there at the side of the president, were today saying, uh, as far as they're concerned, there will be a peaceful transfer. Kathleen Hall Jamison, thank you so much. You're welcome. With just 40 days until Election Day, health care is becoming a bigger issue in the campaign. That's due in part to the death of Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg and the possibility that the fate of the federal health care law could be argued before the Supreme Court just one week after the election. Today, President Trump tried to broaden his appeal on his health care record. William Brangham checks the rhetoric against the record. Judy, President Trump today signed what he calls two key executive orders. One of them pledges to end what's known as surprise medical billing, which can leave patients with huge unexpected debts. The second says the U.S. will make sure that insurers don't discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. But these orders don't change any laws. Congress has to do that. And all of this comes as the president is trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act 
which already protects pre-existing conditions. For more on all of this, I am joined by Paige Winfield Cunningham. She covers healthcare for the Washington Post. Uh, Paige Winfield Cunningham, very good to have you here. So today's event was billed as the America First healthcare plan, but this wasn't really a plan per se, the long promised plan from the president. This was the signing of two executive orders. As I mentioned, one of them deals with pre-existing conditions. I think we have about a quarter of all Americans have what would be considered a pre-existing condition. Uh, what is this order and does it help protect them? Right. Well, this is really clearly an effort by Trump six weeks before the election to try to look like he is on sort of the winning side of this issue. Um, but there's a lot of dispute over whether he can even legally use the executive authority, use an executive order to extend these protections. And almost certainly this would be challenged in court. Um, a lot of people are questioning this already. Um, and of course, you know, the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010 pioneered this, was the first le was the legislation that extended these protections to Americans, and the administration has refused to defend that law, and the case will be heard by the Supreme Court, of course, on November 10th. And it's really been remarkable, I would say, uh, last year and this year especially, as you've seen President Trump and Republicans try to completely rewrite the record on who has been in favor of these protections. It plays really, really well with voters, and Democrats have successfully leveraged it against Republicans in the 2018 elections. And so there's this very blatant attempt by Trump to make it look as though he's sort of been a champion of this all along, even though behind the scenes, he's done a lot of things to actually undermine those very protections. So if the Supreme Court were to do away with the Affordable Care Act uh, and Congress, as this executive order orders them to do to try to address this issue, if that does not happen, theoretically a quarter of Americans could face some kind of discrimination with regards to their coverage? Right. So what would happen if, if we saw these protections fall? Um, and I should add, we aren't we aren't certain of that. There's a lot of different scenarios that could play out. And there's actually a very simple fix Congress could do to all of this to make this lawsuit go away. Um, but if they were toppled, this would kind of go back to the lay of the land before the ACA was passed, before 2010, where it was up to states to regulate this. And you really saw a variety of approaches. Uh, some of the more liberal states, say California and other states, uh, run by Democrat tended to more be run by Democrats would uh, you know put restrictions on what insurers could discriminate based on. Um, other states had very few restrictions. You saw, I know, in Arizona was an example of essentially insurers could discriminate against. Uh, essentially anything. And not only that, but they could refuse, if they knew that someone had had a particular condition in the past, they could refuse to cover treatment in the future that was in any way related to that condition that someone had had. So it was really the wild, wild west in the individual market for these folks. So uh, let's turn quickly in the last uh, half minute we have before we have to go. The, the second executive order uh, addresses surprise medical billing. Again, is there are there teeth in this executive order? Will this actually solve this very serious problem? This is an extremely tricky legislative problem. You saw Congress really struggling through the nitty gritty details of exactly how to do this. All of last year, we had different legislation in the House and the Senate, different opinions about how to tackle this. It's very complex. The only thing this executive order does is it basically instructs Congress to keep working on the issue. And then if they don't produce legislation by January 1st, that HHS should then try to figure out how they could tackle this administratively. But again, it is a very complex issue. This is why Congress hasn't yet been able to unify around a single bill. Um, and so Trump just coming out today and claiming that he's solved surprise medical billing is is extremely far from the truth and a very misleading thing to tell the American people. All right. Paige Winfield Cunningham of The Washington Post. Thank you very much. Thank you.
pandemic has spurred a surge in camping and RV travel as social distancing has become one of the catchphrases of COVID-19. But it's not all fun and vacations. One group of Americans has long since adopted a self-sufficient lifestyle, living full-time in motorhomes and working seasonal jobs to support themselves. Our economics correspondent Paul Salman has the story. It's part of our Making Sense series, Unfinished Business. And a note, some of the story was shot before the pandemic began. This is the couch that turns into a bed. Uh -huh. To Darla McLean, 64, and husband Bill, also 64, a former biker and hellraiser, this is home sweet home. Our whole bedroom is done in Levi's. These are all my old pants. The McLeans have been living in an RV since 2010, after the Great Recession sank their L.A. motorcycle repair shop and their home. We had a $700,000 house that we owed about uh, 200000 on that sold for one hundred thirty-one On the auction block. Broke, the McLean sold what was left and hit the road. I mean, it was that or rent an apartment and get jobs locally, but there were no jobs. So they drove to where the work was. Our first job was Amazon in Coffeyville, Kansas. A two-month stint in the warehouse, holiday rush. It was pretty rough. They expect certain numbers, and you have to hustle. Bill over-hustled. He blew his knee out. I don't normally walk at 60 miles an hour pushing a heavy cart going around 90 degree turns. Amazon was the first of some 20 seasonal gigs. When we first met them last fall, the McLeans were parked across from a Las Vegas Ikea to peddle pumpkins and then Christmas trees. With us, we have what we call wheel estate. We just, we just take the covers off, <laughs> lift the levelers, fire it up, and we go where the economy is good. Tens of thousands of retirement age Americans are migrant laborers or work campers, driven by economic necessity and wanderlust. This is Judy Arnold's fourth year work camping. She's been tending a store in Yellowstone National Park since June. It wasn't very busy at first, but as time went on, it got busier and busier until we have more people now than we have had in regular seasons. People were just tired of being cooped up at home and they thought, let's go to, you know, the parks. More sightseers drawn away from COVID and back to nature means a lot more work for a work camper like Arnold. I'm doing the work of three people right now. The pandemic has driven an awful lot of Americans onto the road. But the number of mobile living, gig hopping work campers has been growing for years. Every January, hordes convene in Quartzsite, Arizona, the site of an annual RV show. That's where we met 66-year-old Susan Otteros. You end up in these really neat places, like Yosemite. Otteros works as a camp host, main tasks, checking in campers, and, if you're up for it, cleaning. I don't do the bathrooms. <laughs> My boyfriend does the bathrooms. I collect the money. Mitch Craighead drafts camp hosts for a thousand trails campsites. How many 75-year-olds do you recruit? More than you'd expect. Baby boomers are retiring. The pool of workers that we're hiring for is growing dramatically. That was in January. The company declined to give us specifics, but Mitchell says campgrounds are busier than ever these days. We've always looked at ourselves in the camping industry as the original social distancing. And a lot of our new customers are telling us just that. We've seen a significant spike in reservations um, for the remainder of the camping year this year. At the RV show, work camping veterans Rick and Tammy Womack moved into their motorhome nine years ago after their son died by suicide. We started out with what we call our journey for Joshua, which was to honor our son. But the reality after about three years was it's expensive to live on the road. You need new tires, maintenance costs are high. And big campers get just seven miles a gallon. So for the past seven years, they've worked the North Dakota sugar beet harvest. I didn't even know what a sugar beet was. Well, I thought sugar came from sugar cane. Yeah, because where I come from, it does. You know, Dixie Crystal. But instead, 55% uh, of our sugar comes from sugar beets instead of sugar cane in the country. Muddy 12-hour shifts at $14 an hour plus overtime until the beets run out. Some nomad gigs pay a lot more than that. Ms. J transports RVs from manufacturer to dealer and sees the country. I can pick the jobs I want to take to go see various destinations. So if there's an RV that needs to go to Florida, which I have done this, delivered in Miami, I went on over to Key West. And how much do you get paid for that? 
I would say somewhere between 60 and 75. That's 60 to $75,000 a year driving four days a week. These days, RVs are selling like hotcakes, but Ms. J is sitting out the pandemic in a tiny house in Georgia until next year. Cases are up, especially for, you know, certain communities, communities of color. And I'm, I know quite a few of people who have been affected. And so I, I just kind of choose to lay low until things kind of, you know, simmer down a little bit. <laughs> can you afford to? I can. I've been doing this pattern over a number of years where I was able to financially prepare myself for the what ifs. And this is one of those what ifs. Back in January, in the big tent, there were hawkers of tire pressure monitors, RV window cleaners, orthotics. We reconnected with Bill and Darla McLean, who'd driven here from Mexico, where they go for affordable health care. Shrimp tacos are killer. We have a great pharmacist down there. We get glasses and our teeth worked on. I don't know why, how they can charge so much for stuff here that you can go right down there and get the same thing for a fraction of the cost. But the McLeans were at the RV show for a gig to sign up other work campers as oil field gate guards. You have to man the gate 24 hours a day. Um, they pay 150 a day for that. Now look, work camping obviously isn't for everyone. Does this interest you? No, not at all. And why is that? Because I retired for a reason. I don't want to go back to work. But Bill and Sandy Collins like what they heard. They work camp, helping fund their wanderings. We work um, Adventureland, then we go to J.C. Penney's, and then Doing what? Uh, working in the warehouse at J.C. Penney's. Even in bankruptcy, J.C. Penney's warehouse is still running, and as at Amazon, you have to step up. It's going to stay a lot better than, than I would if I sat down. That's one of the appeals of work camping to George Stoutenberg. I can't see myself stopping work. I can't do nothing. What, what is nothing? You sit around and what, wait to die? That's not me. But he also needs the money. It's not like we're broke, but we're certainly not, you know, millionaires. We can't afford to just travel the world and do whatever we want to do. That would be a wonderful thing, but it's not my life. Judy Arnold's current Yellowstone gig has kept her more than busy, but when it ends in October, she isn't sure what she'll do. There's a huge population of us that are still in limbo, wondering if there is a next job to go to. And a lot of my coworkers, where they normally go, the places aren't open. So I'm definitely worried because I definitely need an income. Stupid glue, too. As for Bill and Darla McLean, they've been parked outside their daughter's house in Arkansas for several months, making repairs to the RV. I think for the most part, uh, we've been surviving and trying to just get through this like most people are. It is a little weird for RVers. I know that for a fact. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world to find it's a place. It's not really that we can't travel. It's just once you get where you're going. And where do you stay? But this weekend, they're getting back on the road, headed to a new job, working, and hoping to find places to camp. For the PBS NewsHour, this is Paul Salmon. Today in the House Foreign Affairs Committee hearing room, there was an empty chair for Michael Pack, the CEO of the U.S. Agency for Global Media. Pack ignored a subpoena from lawmakers who today are in concern that he has politicized and mismanaged media outlets that helped the U.S. win the Cold War, including Voice of America. Nick Schifrin begins our report with another action by Pack foreign VOA journalist being forced to leave the U.S. Valya Baraputi's career at Voice of America ended with a one-way ticket. She, Michael Pack. Ronald Reagan apparently said that, you know, if you let go of the, the wheel of the car, it veers left. And there's something to that. The media te un, undirected goes left. It has a left-wing, leftward bias. In audio interviews, Pack also cites national security. He says the foreign journalists on U.S. visas weren't properly vetted, leaving the organization vulnerable to espionage. Journalism, to be a journalist, is a great cover for a spy. It's just a great cover. And from the beginning, from the Cold War and even earlier, they've been penetrated. These are the same slurs that are hurled at them by the Kremlin. Jamie Fly led Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, which is funded by USAGM, before he was fired by PAC. So it's incredibly dangerous 
for the USAGM head to start basically writing the press release that the Kremlin can then turn around and use the next week about uh, USAGM journalists. PBS NewsHour spoke to a half dozen of the more than 70 VOA journalists whose visas weren't renewed. None would go on the record, but one provided this document. Confirmation they filled out a standard U.S. government background check used for many administration officials. It's more than 100 pages long. Mr. Pack is making it seem like uh, national security is, is at risk here. If Grant Turner was the CFO of USAGM until he was fired by PAC. I think it's really just sort of pretext and, and a good cover for uh, taking some, you know, abhorrent actions. The Courier, a ship without guns, goes into battle armed with the greatest weapon of all, truth. Voice of America was created by the U.S. government to broadcast behind the Iron Curtain to promote American ideas by presenting objective news. This is Radio Liberty. Alongside VOA, USAGM provides grants to independent corporations that are supposed to be independent media outlets. Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Radio Free Asia, the Middle East Broadcast Network, and Open Technology Fund, which funds tools that help evade government censorship and surveillance. PAC fired their leaders and replaced their bipartisan boards with partisan ones. Today, the witnesses said that degraded the media organization's credibility. Amanda Bennett was fired by PAC as VOA president. The very fact that our news is provided outside the control of any party in power gives VOA its own power. Today, VOA and the other agencies broadcast in more than 60 languages to an audience of more than 350 million. I will end the Muslim ban on day one. VOA's Urdu service came under fire for broadcasting without context, a campaign ad from Joe Biden. Senior VOA journalists later removed the video from its platforms. But if that shouldn't have aired, here's what aired more recently on VOA Spanish channels before journalists called for its removal. La agenda radical de Joe Biden that's Trump campaign official Mercedes Schlapp telling viewers the Joe Biden campaign will destroy Hispanic families. There's been past criticism of USAGM funding, morale, and structure, but even some Republicans criticize PAC. Top House Foreign Affairs Republican Mike McCall. Make no mistake, I believe there's some reform that needs to be done, but I don't think we should throw out the baby out with the bathwater. Connecticut Democrat Tom Malinowski. If China, Russia, North Korea, or any of our adversaries had in fact infiltrated USAGM, they could not possibly have done more harm to America's interests than Mr. Pack has in fact done on his own. And joining us now is Jamie Fly, former foreign policy advisor to Marco Rubio, former defense official under George W. Bush. And as you just saw uh, in that piece, was the president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, until he was fired by Michael Pack. Jamie, Fly, welcome to the news hour. Uh, you're a Republican. Um, do you believe that what PAC is doing is partisan? I'm not even sure it's partisan. I think what we learned today at the hearing is that uh, there appears to be just a lot of gross mismanagement of the agency underway right now. Uh, there were Democrats and Republicans fired in mass, uh, and he's putting these national security tools, these tools of American soft power, at risk. And I don't, I'm not even sure it has a lot to do with politics. Why does it matter? that an organization like yours, RFE, RL, Voice of America, these other organizations are seen perhaps as not independent under Michael Pack. Over the decades, they've gained a loyal following in closed societies in places like Russia, China, Iran, uh, Belarus, which is incredibly relevant right now as the Belarusian people are uh, out in the streets trying to topple Lukashenko. And uh, their credibility stems from their independence and their adherence to uh, the highest professional standards of journalism. And that's really what is being threatened right now by Mr. Pack's actions, by the removal of the network heads, by some of his attempts and the people who are working with him to influence the coverage of networks like Voice of America. You mentioned Voice of America, which is a federal news service you mentioned, USAGM, of course, which is a federal entity, RFERL, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, is a little different, known as a grantee, because those federal agencies give money, grant money to your organization, or the organization that you used to lead. What are you worried about, about these supposedly independent organizations moving forward under Michael Pack? But Mr. Pack uh, has used his powers, not just to remove the network heads like myself, but he also replaced the corporate boards. 
He made himself chairman of the corporate board. He appointed his chief of staff to the corporate board. And he's filled the rest of the board slots with mostly Trump administration officials. It is de facto federalizes these entities, which for decades, in the case of RFERL, have operated as non-governmental organizations and have been able to be truly independent in their reporting in ways that start to become threatened once you have federal officials uh, sitting on their board. Jamie Fly, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Even with so much attention focused on the pandemic, the threat and toll of cancer remains enormously important. In the U.S., breast cancer remains the second deadliest cancer for women. Estimates suggest that more than 42,000 people will die from it this year. And more than 275,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in 2020. But there are more than three and a half million women in America who are survivors, meaning they have been treated or are still being treated. A new book focuses on those very issues, how to battle and live with breast cancer. It's written by our own Allie Rogan, a producer here at the NewsHour, about her own experience and that of other women. It's called Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, 30 Powerful Stories. I spoke with her earlier this week. Allie, welcome. It's very good to have you with us. Congratulations on the book. You've written this illuminating and, and really personal book, personal story about what happened with you and with so many other women. And it all started, in your case, with your getting the results back of genetic testing, and you were just a college senior. That's right, Judy. I tested positive for the BRCA1 genetic mutation, which is now better known as the Angelina Jolie gene, following that actress becoming very public with it several years after my experience. This is a genetic mutation that increases a woman's risk of breast and ovarian cancer exponentially over the course of their lifetime. And at the time I was going through this, there weren't a whole lot of resources out there for me. Uh, it certainly wasn't as mainstream as it became once Angelina Jolie went public. So I had a hard time figuring out what to do. I uh, stressed out a lot. I debated uh, my options. And I ultimately decided to have a preventative double mastectomy with reconstructive surgery right before I graduated. And that was the right decision for me. I've never looked back. That was about 10 years ago. And uh, what I realized, though, when Angelina went public with her story a few years later is how, uh, how much of a sense of solidarity I felt that she was using her platform to speak out publicly. I felt a lot less alone than I did when I was going through my experience. And uh, in retrospect, as I thought about how I could use my experience to help other people, I figured that if I felt that way following reading Angelina's story, other people might feel that really great sense of uh, comfort when they read the stories of other women who we all admire, who have gone through uh, breast cancer or a related experience. You do write, uh, Ali Rogan, about the importance of community, having people there with you. Um, I want to ask you about that, because the first person you, you profile here is uh, somebody many of us know. Uh, she was Cokie Roberts, uh, ABC, of course, and, and NPR correspondent for many years, uh, someone we all looked up to as a journalist, and she sat down with you and talked about her own experience. That's exactly right. To me, uh, the late, great Cokie Roberts is someone who really embodies the entire message of the book. It's called Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, but I want to make very clear that beating breast cancer doesn't have to look one way or the other. I think we're all too limited by our definition of talking about beating breast cancer as becoming cancer-free and uh, living cancer-free for the rest of your life. That is a far too limiting definition. Uh, Cokie Roberts, when I interviewed her, she had gone through a very public uh, cancer battle earlier in her life, and uh, she had talked quite a bit about it and be had become a strong advocate for other women battling breast cancer. What I didn't know when I interviewed her was that she had recently f found out that uh, her cancer had returned and it had come back worse. And 
the fact that she was so willing to speak to me about her earlier experience and talk about how she lived her life and the importance of right. being close to family, doing the things that make you happy, uh, even as she was back in the fight actively, was a lesson that I didn't really fully learn until she passed away because she did not tell me that she was back actively in the fight. So I think when you talk about beating breast cancer, nobody embodied that more than Koki Roberts, who I believe beat breast cancer every single day of her life. And Ali, you went on to talk to uh, several dozen other women about how they made decisions about their own treatment. Some of them well-known women, Cheryl Crow, uh, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, but other, others we, we don't know as well. But your point all the way through is that each one made her own decision about how to handle this terrible thing and, that she was dealing with. Absolutely. It's such a critical point, Judy. There is no right way to deal with breast cancer. There is no uh, single way to deal with breast cancer. Every single person dealing with breast cancer or any other type of cancer deals with it in their own way, and they are entitled to deal with it in their own way. Lots of people, for example, like to have friends and family come visit them when they're getting treatment, although, of course, in the time of the coronavirus, that isn't always possible. But there are, of course, many people who say, I want chemotherapy or radiation or what have you to be my time. I don't want anybody there. Uh, and they use that time to uh, have uh, some moments to themselves. Many people chose not to inform anybody but their uh, closest caretaker or their spouse um, until after they were done with their treatment because they didn't want to have to deal with the emotional burden in many cases of having to deal with other people's reaction to your own diagnosis. That can be something that is just as draining as dealing with your own feelings about a diagnosis. Well, you have performed such a great service, Ali Rogan, in telling these stories and going and collecting these stories and sharing them with us, as I said, from women uh, who names we recognize and other women we don't. But every single story here is worth reading and worth sharing. Ali Rogan, it's beast, Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, 30 Powerful Stories. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. And we're so proud of Allie for writing that book. Uh, it is a gift to so many women and men uh, who may be dealing with breast cancer. And coming up later tonight, a PBS NewsHour primetime special on Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We will assess her impact on American society and look at the issues at play in the battle to replace her. Here's a first look. Ruth Bader Ginsburg changed the law. She has compiled a truly historic record. She changed the court. We are certainly here to stay. She changed America. She was the moral beacon. We look back at her life and ahead at the battle to replace her. Fill that seat. This fight has just begun. RBG, her legacy and the court's future. A PBS NewsHour special, Thursday at 8, 7 central. We'll talk to Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, among others. We hope you'll join us. And that's a news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Join us online and again here tomorrow evening for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you. Please stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by Architect, Beekeeper, Mentor. A Raymond James Financial Advisor tailors advice to help you live your life. Life well planned. Consumer Cellular. Johnson and Johnson. BNSF Railway. The Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Sloan Foundation, driven by the promise of great ideas. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. And friends of the News Hour.
This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS News Hour West. From WETA studios in Washington and from our bureau at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University.